This is the chart that you're going to be receiving right here. If you turn it over, it's got a map on the back. And I'm going to be referring to the map here because our subject here today is the calm before the storm. And I'm going to be talking to you and, what, and then what that has to do with us today. What does that storm that was before the calm that happened to Paul on the uh, Mediterranean Sea, what does that have to do with us today? So I'm going to be talking to you about that. Let me get a focus here. So this is what you have got. Let me move in on it a little bit. Get it up as close as I can. All right. That's what you have got. And then on the reverse side, you will be having a map like this that I'm going to explain to you in a few moments. Everybody with me? All right. Uh, our subject here, if you look at our notes up there, many Paul's journey from Caesarea to Rome. Uh, I want you to turn with me here to the book of Acts A. Paul appears, appeals unto Caesar. Let me show you what happened here. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about this storm that they encountered and some lessons for us involving this. This is the calm before the storm. The, uh, the ultimate lesson that I'm going to talk to you about is the calm that we're in now before the storm is coming. We're, we're going to be faced with a storm that's coming our way. I don't mean a wind storm. I'm talking about trouble in the world. The Bible talks about it. I'll show you all kind of scripture, but I'm going to give you the illustration of Paul's journey. And uh, I have read in other history books that this one in the book of Acts about Paul's uh, journey to Rome uh, is one of the best described descriptions of a storm at sea that they have on any kind of literature anywhere. And this is the one that Paul, let me have you go with us. I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but if, go with me, if you would, to the book of Acts. And we are referring here to the very first one here. Paul's journey from Caesarea to Rome. A, Paul appeals unto Caesar. Go to Acts 25.10 and look at this with me very closely here. And uh, then said Paul, I, I uh, stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. Let me say this. Uh, Paul, he was in Caesarea. I'll show you this on the map in just a moment. But he was in Palestine, Paul was. Uh, the Jews had brought all kinds of accusations against Paul because Paul had turned from Judaism to Christianity and become a leader in Christianity, which means they believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And the Jews as a whole, as a nation, did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. So they rejected Jesus and all of his teachings. Paul was, a, was an advent believer in Christ. Remember, Jesus was the one that appeared to him on the road to Damascus. He said, you know, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. And then he became a disciple of Jesus and became the, the, the apostle to the Gentiles in particular. Paul had gone on three different missionary journeys, three of the way up into, what is today, Turkey and Greece and Macedonia and, uh, and all those areas that he had evangelized. Three different trips he had made up there and established many churches, many people got saved. He came back and went to Rome, I mean, went to uh, Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, uh, they had tried to catch him and bring some charges against him of some type. And anyhow, it got very complicated. So they put him in the hands of the Roman government, which was their capital city in Palestine at that time, was Caesarea, was a little town on the coast of, of the Mediterranean Sea. So the, the Romans had their little capital there, and the Jews had their capital, of course, in Jerusalem. And so it was a yeah, yeah thing going back and forth. And uh, everybody was trying to get along with everybody, but Paul was a bone of contention. I'm going to read here where that the Jews came to this Roman governor and said, we want you to turn Paul back over to us. We want to try him, take care of him, and punish him the way we do things. And he says, no, 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 you can't do it. And what Paul knew about himself 
was that he was not only a Jew, but he was also a legal Roman citizen. That was very important back in those days. At one time, he used it against those some Gentiles. He said, they said, I'm a Roman citizen. They said, men have paid big prices to get their Roman citizenship. He said, I was born free. That meant that he was born, his father was also a Roman citizen, which meant, meant that he was in very special place as far as being a Roman citizen. So Paul knew what he could do here, and this is why he did what he did. Now, uh, in verse 10, I'm gonna read this, 25:10. Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged, not by these Jews, but by these Romans. He said, to the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I am a fender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof these accusations, uh, these accuse me, no man may deliver me into them. And then Paul makes this statement, I appeal unto Caesar, which was a privilege that every Roman citizen had. I appeal unto Caesar. And when he did that, that meant that he had to be taken to Rome in order to appeal to Caesar because he knew that if he stayed in, in Palestine, those Jews would eventually kill him. He knew that. Not only that, but he also had a feeling inside and the Lord had already told him ahead of time that he was gonna put him in places that he could witness to kings and leaders and rulers and people in high places. So Paul here said, I appeal unto Caesar. And then in verse 12, then Festus, which was the, the, uh, the Roman governor there, when he had conferred with the council, answered, hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar thou shalt go. I'm gonna send you there. So with these words here, Paul and so arrangements were made that he might be sent unto them. Uh, so I'm gonna have you look at the map if you would for a moment. Now if you can turn it over, and what you're going to be seeing is this map here. And I've got it penciled out on my map. But here's where they were down here. Way down where my pen is. This is Palestine down here. These colors may throw you off a little bit. But uh, just bear with me here. The, uh, if you'll notice, this pink in here is blue. This pink over here is blue on the screen. I don't know why, but it is. But anyhow, this is where he was at Caesarea. When he said, I appeal unto Caesar, they put him on a ship. And he sailed from there and up here, touched base in one place, went on up here to the, uh, to the Isle of Cyprus, sailed around the coast, went on over here to a place called Myra. And when he got over here to, uh, to Myra, uh, he changed ships. Now, I want you to go to 27. This is Acts chapter 27 now. And this is the very ne next verse. This is B here in your notes. And then turn the page over and you'll see B there. This is uh, Acts 27. And I want to read verse 5 and 6. When he had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And that's the city right here where this arrow is pointing. This is where he left from. They sailed over here. He came to this point right here, came to Myra. And, uh, and whenever they did there, here's what happened in Myra. Uh, verse six, and there, there the centurion. Now he was under a centurion. A centurion was a captain of a of hundred soldiers. So he was, uh, there was all these soldiers, Roman soldiers on board this ship. And they were really the ones in control. And of course, there was the seaman and the, and the owner of the ship and all that. But this was the one. It says here, I'm going to read five and six again. And when we had sailed over the Sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia and came to Myra, a city of, of Lycia, and there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing unto Italy. Now, Alexandria is down here in the bottom. It's right here in Egypt. Alexandria is right there where my pen is pointing, right? Can you see it right there? And that the ship had sailed up to, here to, to this, to Myra. And so when they came around, they shifted him over to a ship that was coming up from Alexandria that was on its way over to Rome over here. And so they put him on board that ship. 
And uh, this was with all the soldiers and everybody on it. Now I'm going to read this verse. Uh, look at verse 9. I'm jumping to verse 9, verse 20, chapter 27 here. 27, 9. Now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous. Now notice this very closely, folks. Sailing was dangerous because the fast was now already passed. Now, unless you would understand the Jewish laws and Jewish feast days, you would not even know what this is talking about. But with the Jewish people, they did not sail the Mediterranean Sea after the Day of Atonement, which was the end of September. There was three feast days that the Jews had, the Passover, the Feast of, 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 of First Fruits, which is Pentecost, and then they had the uh, Day of Atonement or the Feast of the, the, of the Harvest at the end, at the end of the uh, summer months and so forth. So it was after September. In other words, they would sail up until the feast day and they went by their own little calendar system, the Jews did, and they said that after this day, it's dangerous to sail on the Mediterranean Sea because the winds can change so fast and there's a north wind that'll come down and blow across the sea and ships are in danger. So that's what Paul was referring to here. And he said here in this ninth verse, now when much time was spent and when the sailing was now dangerous, in verse nine, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. Paul talked to all of them on that ship, especially that centurion and those soldiers. And look at verse 10 and said unto them, sir, I perceive that this voyage will be with much hurt and much damage, not only of the lading in the ship, but also of our lives. This is not the time to be sailing to Rome. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more because they wanted to get to Rome, more than those things which were spoken of by Paul. So they said, oh, forget Paul. Now, go to the next one here. Uh, go to B here on your notes. I want you to go to B here. I'm going to flip this over and then back again. Go to B on your notes here. They changed ships at Mary. Uh, I'm in two here. When the south wind blew softly. Now notice this very closely. Everybody still with me? Stay with me on this. Verse 13. And when the south wind blew softly. Supposing that they had obtained their purpose. Loose events. They sailed close to Crete. In other words, they had put in over here at Crete right here. They had left here. They'd sailed around in here. Everything was going pretty good. They sailed down around Crete and they were getting lined up to go over here and go to Rome. And as they came down here, they sailed close to Crete. They put in at a place called Fair Haven here in, in the Isle of Crete, right in here. And, uh, and they were going to go there and then they were going to decide whether they wanted to sail or not now. And then they decided that maybe later they would go to this island, this other place at the end of Crete, right here, just a little distance. And they would go there and maybe winter until the storms, bad storms happen. So, verse 13, when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close to Crete. They sailed in very close to them, thinking everything was going all right. When the south wind blew softly. Now, before I go any further, I want to just talk to you a little bit from my heart. When I was a boy, I grew up in uh, Pensacola, Florida, and uh, along the Gulf Coast up there. I was born in Pensacola, grew up early age, and then uh, later, when I was about 10 years old, we moved to Miami and I finished growing up in Miami. But uh, originally, we were in Pensacola, and I remember as a boy on Saturdays, my mother and dad taking me and my siblings and our cousins and uncles and aunts would all go down to the beach on a Saturday and they'd cook things on the beach and the ladies would and the men would do some fishing and they had cast nets and they'd catch those fish and dress them out and cook them for dinner. And we just had a great time. We just played and everything had a great time. I remember looking at trees along that Gulf Coast and they were all leaning toward the north. Now, I remember I'm on the Gulf Coast of Florida up in the Panhandle. 
and then leaning toward the north, all those trees along there, tough trees, strong trees, cedar trees and things like that, all leaning toward the north. And one day I asked my mother, I said, Mom, why are all the trees leaning toward the north? Has a storm been through here? She says, no, son. It's the south wind that blows continuously off the gulf that pushes those, from the time they're little plants, it begins to shape them to look and lean toward the north. And I never will forget the answer that I got when I asked about those trees leaning toward the north. Now, let me just say something to you here today, and I feel the Holy Ghost in saying this. I feel it all over me. There's a south wind blowing softly now in America and in the world, and it's shaping our views and our thoughts and our thinking about a lot of things in this world. The south wind is blowing softly. It's not affecting the church as much as it's affecting the ones out there. And so the things that once were bad are no longer bad. Things that are dangerous are no longer dangerous. Ideas, philosophies, theories, attitudes are beginning to change things a little bit. So the wind is blowing softly. There's some things we have to, we're now being told that we must now become very tolerant of, very tolerant of. I'm talking about some homosexuality, for instance. And if you even begin to think that anything is wrong with that or men marrying men and women marrying women, if you even think that that's wrong, shame on you, bad on you, that's south winds blowing softly. You know, nothing mean, nothing malicious, but it's only the calm before the storm. And this is what Paul and them, that's what that ship experienced. They said, the south wind blows softly. That's what's happening in the world today. But folks, there's coming troubles and problems and situations like you have never dreamed would ever happen on this earth and to America. I'm sorry to say it. The Bible says that when sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. Grace is the goodness and the mercy of God toward us. And so God's grace for people to get saved is out there. It's in our hearts, it's in our minds. People are being dealt with by the Spirit of God. You'd be surprised how many people are looking for some truth. They're looking for reality. They're looking where the truth of God is. Uh, there's a guy that told me in the mall the other day, my wife and I were walking in there. and I don't know whether he'll be here Sunday morning service or not, but he said, me and my wife will be in Sunday morning service with you. I'm, I'll be looking for him today. But we invited them to come to church, you know. Now, I don't know what's going to happen out of that. I have no idea. But you know what I'm talking about. You invite people all the time. So while the soft wind is blowing softly and people are forming a lot of crazy ideas, let's stay close to the Lord. And Paul knew the answers. Now I'm going to go on to this because it didn't stay that way long. A storm came. Now I'm going to, I read verse 13, when the south wind blew softly, supposing they obtained their purpose, loose and clean, they sailed close to Crete. They got back to sea. But verse 14, but not long after those there arose against it a temptuous wind called Euroclidon. Euroclidon. And the Euroclidon was a storm that came from the north that all of a sudden began to blow and it began to blow upon them. And then when the ship was caught, verse 15, when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. They just had to go with it. And I won't give a description for all this. There's a lot of reading here, but what happened, they were gonna sail from here around over here to this point, maybe winterize there. And so they sailed and as soon as they left here, that wind came down from the north and it began to blow them, blow them away from it. And they realized they were in trouble. I'm jumping over here to verse 18 of Acts. Everybody still with me? 27, 18. Now they're in the, the winds blowing against them. Verse 18, and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day, they cast out with all their hands the tackling of the ship. They were in a storm now. And when, the, when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, 
and no small tempest lay on them. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. And uh, so I'm just showing you here that they were caught in this storm and the storm blew them and they were trying to fight this and they were fighting it and they were sailing across this sea here. They didn't hardly know where they were all up and down in through here actually. I got a straight line, but they're going all over here and they had no idea hardly where they were. They couldn't read the stars. They couldn't take a, a compass and say, okay, there's the North Star, we're this way. We had, they were all, it was all turned around. All they knew that there was a bad storm coming out of the North and coming out of the East over here, blowing them and they were just having to fight it. Now, thank God for the people of God. Amen. Thank God for truth. Thank God they had Paul on the ship. Praise the Lord. Look what happened here. Look at verse 21. Verse 20 ended by saying that all hope was taken away. Verse 21 now of this same 27th chapter. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and have gained this harm and loss. You should have listened. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. Oh, wait a minute, Paul. We're in the middle of a storm and the wind's blowing. Everything's going bad for us. You said being of good cheer. For there shall not be one loss of any life among you but of the ship. The ship's going to go down, but you won't. None of you will be lost. Nobody will die. Now look at verse 23 here. Oh, thank you, Jesus. For there stood by me this night the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve. That's referring to God, not the angel, but God. The angel of the God whom I am and whom I belong to him and I serve him. Now look at verse 27, 24, saying, Fear not, Paul, this is what the angel said to him. Thou must be brought before Caesar. God's going to get you there. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Isn't that wonderful? Because God had his hand on Paul and was with Paul. God is going to be good to those that's just with him. I'm telling you folks, the church has more positive effects in this world than what you can ever imagine. Praise the Lord. You may not say anything, you may not be doing something special or anything, but the fact that we are here, we're keeping the judgments of God away yet. We're keeping the storms away yet. God's got his blessings, praise the Lord, on the church yet. There are people that are yet to be saved because there's a church. Thank God for the church. I don't mean the building here. I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about you and me. This is the church. This is the building of the house of God. This is the house that we're in. But the church is us. We're the church. We're the kingdom of God on earth. The kingdom is within us. That's why it's important to have the Holy Ghost. That's why it's important to be baptized in Jesus' name. Because the praise the Lord, that's how we are in the church, in, the, in Christ. Christ in us, in the Holy Ghost, us in Christ in baptism. Praise the Lord and to have repented of our sins and said, Lord, and then walk with God, live for God, serve the Lord. And if you don't know how to do it, it's, it's all in the epistles telling us how to live and how to walk with God, how to serve the Lord, how to worship. All of those things are in the epistles. And that's why God has given us pastors, that they may preach to us, teach to us, talk to us, and tell us all these things that we may say, God, we want to walk with you, Lord, and keep being faithful until you come. So the Lord said, Paul, and the angel said to Paul, uh, the Lord said through the angel to Paul, and all those with you, they're not going to perish, all gone, they're going to all be saved as well. So he said, be of good cheer. There shall not be any men. Uh, now look at verse 24, saying, fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and Lord God has given thee all thing with thee. Now look at verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. I believe God. So just hang in there, be of good cheer, and God's going to be with us, and God's going to see us through, and God is going to keep his hand on us. Now, what happened? I won't read this in the Bible, but it's a beautiful story here. They, they sailed across here and hit the, the, landed on the island of Melita, of Melita. 
uh, Melita was right here. They went in here and some, some of the sailors tried to get on boats and get off the ship before it wrecked. Paul said to the centurion, tell the captain of the ship, they can't get off. Don't even try to get off the boat. Stay with the ship and you'll be okay. Don't get off the ship. Stay with the ship and you'll live. If you get off of that boat, you're not going to make it. And so the captain cut their boats loose and said, Paul, we believe you. If an angel of the Lord has been talking to you and you've seen us this, and they're, get, they're now getting into the waters and shallow waters and they knew that there was a coast close by. And so Paul said, stay with, stay with the ship. Now, I want to say this to you and I today here. Stay with the ship, folks. Stay with the ship. Look at number four here. Oh, turn your notes over. Turn your, your, your map over to your notes. Do you like the map on the back side of the note? Yeah. Okay, good. Then thank my daughter for that. She did all that for us. All right, brother and sister. Let me get this up. All right. The storm, we talked about that, the coming storm of the end time. The angel of God appeared to Paul and told him and said, you know, stay with the ship. I want to just make a statement here that we have to stay in the church. You can't just sort of wander out here and do all your thing. You got to stay with the boat, folks. You got to stay in the church. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Let me talk to you, though, about what all that's got to do with us today. Now, I'm not referring to the map here because we've been through the storm at sea there. But I want you to look at your notes here. And we talked about the storm, the coming storm of the end time. Look at number four here. Look at number four, the coming storm of the, of the end time. Now, I'm going to look, have you look at some things that Matthew said. Go with me, us, if you would, to Matthew chapter 24. Chapter 24 is a prophecy that Jesus gave concerning things that are coming on the earth. And... Uh, Look at verse uh, 24 and, and verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Anybody ever heard of sun, mung, you, moon? Sun, sun, uh, mun, am I pronouncing it right? Mung Yoon, noon. I forgot his name. Sun Mung Yoon. Have you ever heard of him? Lift your hand if you had. Now, he had a big following of people. They were called the flower people. And they sold flowers and raised money and gave it to him. He was a Korean. He was a Korean. Sun Mung Yoon, moon, paid my way to go to Korea one time. Me and your pastor and a handful of us. There must have been five or six of us. Paid our way to go over there, flew us over there. Paid all of our hotel expenses, my wife, a bunch of us. We went over there. The purpose of his doing it was to try to convert us to, from Christianity to believe that he was the Messiah. Because he believed he was the Messiah or he taught that he was the Messiah. But he said, yeah, we'll go over there. And we enjoyed a free trip and going over there and <laughs> bought clothes. We bought clothes and went to... You know, went to all this, learn how to say, come to sons, come some to die, thank you, and all that kind of stuff. And anyhow, we had a, 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 a nice week over there, but there did come a time whenever I said, you guys are a bunch of phonies, and I just said, I'm phony them. I said, you're a, you're a liar, you're phonies. You're not right. David said, be quiet, Jacob. They got our passport still, remember that? <laughs> and I said, I don't care. We, 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 had a, we got a U.S. embassy over here in Korea. But they, they didn't do any of that kind of stuff. I am only just saying this, praise the Lord, that there are people like that. And, and believe it or not, he had a lot of people convinced. One guy was even a Pentecostal up from New York State that had been convinced and swung over into that kind of mess. And I pointed him out and, and refuted him. I won't go into details on it, but I just want to tell you here that there are phony Christs all over the place. There have been for ages. And they'll come at you from all kinds of ways and directions and everything else. I remember in the old church down here on Palm Bay Road. I was down there by myself one day in the church, in my office. And there come two guys down the road and came up on the church there and came inside. Are you the pastor? Yes. 
and they had a bathrobes on and flip flops. And I said, can I help you guys? And they said, yeah, this is Moses and this is Elijah. I said, nice to meet you guys. I'm doubting Thomas. <laughs> I'm not going to tell them the truth, right? I'm doubting Thomas. And they said, we just came to tell you, though, know, that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. He's coming. I said, my friend, when Jesus comes, he won't come down the street like you guys did, and neither will you. I said, yes, sir. Well, I guess they probably will, but not like that, not bad or bad. Anyhow, I said, when he comes back, he'll come out of the east because the Bible says he will. So if you see somebody coming down the street and tell me, that, I'm this, I'm that, I'm, I'm the Messiah, you just say, I'm sorry, I'm doubting Tom. You just tell him that. I don't believe it because when Jesus comes, he'll come out of the eastern sky. Let me move on here because I know my time's getting away. Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ or there. This is verse 23. Now I'm in Matthew 24, 23. Verse 24, for there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, shall show great signs and wonders. Whoa. And uh, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he is in the desert, go not out, go not forth. Behold, in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now notice everybody say that. As the lightning comes out of the east, shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 20, and he goes on to talk more about it, and I won't get to read any further on it. But anyhow, Jesus was telling us here about how the Lord's going to come and giving us a warning here not to believe all these things because these are the storms. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the sign of the coming of the things in this world. So number three here, uh, or four here, the coming of the end time, Matthew 24. Look in Isaiah 13, six. Look in Isaiah 13, six. I'm moving a little fast here because I'm a time here. 13, six. How ye for the days of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. The day of the Lord is coming. For the stars of heaven, verse 10, the stars of heaven shall not give the consolation, neither shall they give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Verse 13, Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall be removed out of her place and the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Now, what I'm pointing out to you here that there are some terrible things coming on the earth. There's going to be all kinds. I'm going to read some more things to you in a moment. All kinds of things coming, folks. But I want you to know that we are secure in Christ. Praise the Lord. And the Lord will come and take his church, praise the Lord, and take us out as long as you stay in the boat. Stay with the boat. Praise the Lord. Stay in the ark. Amen. And so God is telling us here to be careful and, uh, and that he will always be with us. Praise the Lord. Now, the message to us here is to stay with the ship. The old ship of Zion. If you look at your notes there. Okay. The message to us, stay with the ship. The old ship of Zion. This, that's what it's called sometimes. It's the church. Noah's ark survived the flood and all those in the ark were saved. Nobody that was in the ark lost their lives when the flood came. It was those that were outside. Now I'm trying to tell you here today how important it is for us to be in the church, in the faith, in the truth of God. And you and I should stay in the church and we will be saved. Now, I've got another set of notes to hand out to you. Matt, if you ushers would come very quickly, I know I've only got about 10 minutes here and I'm gonna wind it up. But this is a lot of scriptures that I'm giving you on this one. This page is loaded with scriptures. Here's what you're gonna be getting right now. And I have uh, felt led of the Lord to pass this along to you here today. And we're not gonna cover these scriptures because there's too many of them. But this is what you're getting. God will always protect and care for the righteous. Now, I've given you a lot of scriptures because I don't want you to throw this away. Keep that somewhere in your Bible. Sometime when you get a chance, read these scriptures. They will inspire you. 
encourage you to lift your spirits. When you feel sometimes like everything's going upside down, read these scriptures. And I want to point them out to you very quickly as you're getting them. Number one, Psalms 4 and 8. Number two, Psalms 5, 11 through 12. Number three, Psalms 9, 9 through 10 and Hebrews 13, 5. Number four, Psalms 20, 32, 26, uh, 68, I mean, 32, 68. Five is Psalm. These are our scriptures. They're lifting your spirits. Psalms 37, 8 and everything. And I've got a little pencil underlined here in Psalms 91. Psalms 91 is one of my favorite. And uh, if you've never read Psalms 91, read it sometime. It's all about God's assurance that he's going to take care of you if you live for God, walk with him and serve him. He'll never fail you, folks. It, it talks about all kinds of situations that can come in our lives, but the Lord's going to be with us. He'll never fail us. Read the entire Psalms. And then verse 8, Psalms 121. This is a short Psalm. It's not very many verses, maybe eight, seven or eight verses. I can't remember. And the entire Psalm, though, both of them are very valuable. But they guarantee us that God's going to be with Proverbs, Genesis 18. I won't get into 1 Peter 3, 12 and 14. Look at that verse of scripture for just a moment. 1 Peter and 3, 12, if you'll look at that one. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. If you've got your Bible, underline that with a, with a pen. Or, I don't, I don't uh, hesitate to put marks in my Bible because you don't change the Word of God. This, this, this book, this paper and ink is, came off a printing press and so forth, and I paid for that. <laughs> That's mine. I, I own the paper and the ink. The Word of God, you don't change. So you can write yourself little notes and things in there. And everything. I've got Bibles that's got so many notes and I push them aside and get another one. Look at verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers and the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteous sake, if it does happen, and some people have suffered for righteousness, the early church did. Happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. So these are some things here that just the writer here is saying here that's found in the scriptures. Amen. Let me move on a little further here. And uh, Matthew 28, 28, 18, 20. Now, why God will look after the righteous? Why will he? And I want you to, there's Psalms 8 and 2. It is a very beautiful scripture. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.18. And I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians here for a moment. And our time is, is uh, running out, but stay with me here. Beautiful things. Let's see here. Okay, here we go. I was there. And I, all right. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 118. For the preaching of the gospel is to them that perish foolishness, but to us, unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. That's the preaching of the gospel. See, the world looks at those things as being maybe not so important, but we understand how important they are. We understand it. But to us, we know it's the power of God for salvation. Look at verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Do you understand what I'm saying here is that the things with God, sometimes foolish things that appear to the world as being foolish, they're the, they're the key that God has for our salvation. I'm jumping down to verse 27. Look at this very closely here. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, weak things, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Notice that, how God works in mysterious ways, that no flesh, and here's the reason, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And God is saying here that no flesh is going to glory in my presence. So I use foolish things. I use simple things. 
I use basic things to confound the people who think that they all, and folks, that's got these guys that's thinking that people's living in, in outer space. The people that's thinking that somebody else is on a mother Mars up, up there. That, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, that, that we all came from one cell amoebas. You know, we all just came out of a pond and just, you know, we just, in fact, we just evolved from that. You, Come on, give me a break. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I can show you, I can show you more scriptures than you can carry, carry away here where it says that God made the heavens and the earth and all things that are therein. Thank God for that. So keep on lifting up the Lord. Keep on praising God. Keep on thanking him. Thank you for the squirrels in your backyard. Thank you for the ducks on the pond. Thank you for the trees that are growing, pine or oak trees or, or flowers or, or whatever, coconut trees, whatever they are, thank God for them, praise the Lord. Because God has put them here and he's given them and we are to stay in the faith, stay in the church, stay with the family of God. Neglect not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, seeing the day approaching. I'm quoting scripture here. Seeing the day approaching. And the day is approaching, folks, and things are going to turn upside down one of these days. I can start reading those to you in the scripture too. And Jesus talked about it. They're going to, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. Everything's going to be turned upside down. There's going to be troubles and trials and, and everything. But God has his hand on the church and one of these days, the trumpet's going to sound. And I think my directions are right. I think that's east. Praise the Lord. And the Lord will come from the east. Hallelujah. And he'll come, praise the Lord. And he'll rise and he'll go around the world from east to west. Praise the Lord. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be there. You say, Brother Myers, that's impossible. So is a bunch of this other stuff they're talking about that we're supposed to be believing. That stuff is all impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. And it's in the word of the Lord. And he said it, I believe it. And he's never failed me yet. All these years I've lived for him. Praise the Lord. Amen. Last year was 75 years I've lived for God. And God has never failed me. Praise the Lord. And he'll never fail us, God, and folks, and anything. I wonder if we could just stand again together and let's just lift our hands and thank him here this morning for his goodness and his blessings and keep <clears throat> keep that second sheet and just refer to it sometimes. God bless you. Stand with us and let's just pray. Lord, we love you so much today. God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the beautiful word of God. Oh, Lord, thank you for your people. Thank you, Lord, for every brother and sister in this congregation. Thank you for those that are not able to be here this morning. Thank you for those that are in every church across the nation and all across the world. God, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and grace and mercy and goodness for all things, Lord. For, Lord, by your grace we are saved and that through our faith. Lord, for we know that it's not of ourselves, but it is of you. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, praise the Lord.